among us hasn't found ourselves in similar context to the one that we heard about in Mark's Gospel this morning. Fear. Aren't you worried that we're perishing? Aren't you listening? In 1983, when I was serving as a deacon in St. Louis, uh, one of the persons who was connected to our faith community uh, was a pilot, and he worked for the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, flying from various places, uh, flying to, to various places from St. Louis to, to do work for the Federal Reserve. And so one Sunday he said, hey, Doug, would you like to, like to go with me sometime? He, he was a pilot of a small airplane. Uh, and and I, I'd only flown those big airplanes that are real safe, you know, the, the ones that uh, make, make sure that we're all okay. So uh, he said to me, hey, I'm, I'm flying up to Des Moines tomorrow morning. Why don't you meet me over at Parks Airfield at Parks College, and we'll go together. And I said, that'd be great. He said, oh, he said we'll, we'll be there and back in about six hours. And I was so excited because I thought, you know, I'd never been in a small plane. And it, it looked like it was going to be really a lot of fun. So we get, I get to the airfield, and, and he brings his, his eight-year-old son with him. And we're getting into this small, small plane. And uh, uh, the, the, Kevin, was his name, and Kevin said, well, why don't you sit in the front seat? I said, no. I said, your, son's, your son will have a, a good time in the, in the front seat. I'll just sit in the back seat. So uh, he said, well, we're just going to fly right up uh, the Mississippi River and then make a, a left turn when we get over to Iowa and just head to Des Moines. And I said, great. So, so it, it, was, it was pretty wonderful until we got to Iowa. And there was this huge storm that just seemed to come out of nowhere. And the plane, the plane was, was you know, the, the size of a small, small uh, car area, basically seats. And, and the, the wind was the only thing that was on the top of us that I couldn't see through. The rest of the plane, the entire cockpit, had one of those, it was all clear glass, or clear, clear plexiglass, or plastic. So, so we got into this storm, and, and there was lightning and thunder, and the, the plane was going up and down like this, and it didn't help matters because his son started throwing up in the front seat, and I was sitting in the back seat going, why on earth did I ever say I'd go down to something? I was scared to death. And, and, and I thought to myself, I, I wanted to shout out to Kevin, aren't you concerned that we're going to perish? And, and, and you know how the other thing is, is that you always think that you're a better driver than your spouse or your partner or your child. And I thought to myself, if I could just get my hands on the aircraft, I could get us out of this. <laughs> and, 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 and yet I thought, oh my gosh. And it was, it was the worst experience I'd ever had. And, and, and then we kind of landed, and we were like, oh. And then I thought to myself, we've got to go back home. <laughs> so Kevin got, his, got, got the work done, and it was literally walking into the airport, picking something up, and he came back into the plane, and he goes, well, are you ready to go home? And I was like, I don't know. And so so we, we, we get in the airport, in the airplane, and this time I'm sitting in the front seat, uh, because his son said, no, Dad, I don't want to sit in the front seat. <laughs> and, and, and so we, we take off from Des Moines, and, and we get up above the clouds, and it is absolutely magnificent. The sun is shining, there's no bad weather, and, and I thought to myself, this is gorgeous. And so, so we, we, get, we get to the Mississippi River, and he makes a right turn, and, and then he says to me, he's seated, he's seated on the left-hand side, and I'm seated here, and there, there are two controls, and he says, Doug, do you want to fly the plane? I said, you're kidding. He said, no. He said, just follow the Mississippi River home. And so I flew the plane for an hour. And it was the most awesome experience I'd ever had. In five hours, to move from terror beyond my own experience to just the most awe-inspiring experience, to be that close. That's what life is often about, isn't it? Fear, trust, Worry, and then awe or thanksgiving. The reason I chose the Job text is because our forebears in faith, uh, those who were responsible for, for both putting together the Hebrew scriptures 
and also uh, compiling them so that, so that we have them. And some of our forebears in the Christian scriptures had this view of the world, this cosmology, that, that somehow uh, the, the way the world was created was that, that God kept all of those evil powers at bay against us. So there was a dome over the earth, and, and God, by God's will, and by God's power, kept all of those evil forces outside the dome from coming in and getting us. And wh whatever was lurking underneath, especially, you, you, you can look at the Psalms in, in some places, and they refer to that great Leviathan. There was a sense of lots of sea monsters under the sea that were also kept at bay by God's intention. The other thing uh, that, that Job is important for us to think about today is, it, you, you all know the story of Job, uh, the, the issue, the issue that, that's really at, at the heart of Job's story is that Job, Job is, is challenged by God. Satan is, is allowed to take everything away from, from Job that he treasures and, and, and engages in a kind of test or barter with God saying, if I take all these good things away from Job and cause him to have trouble, he's going to be unfaithful. I'll, I'll make him that way. And, and so Job... Job is an, is an experience of, of, of the sort of give and take between God and an evil force that, that tests us. And, and Job, in the end, says, I've been righteous. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I don't know why this has happened. And yet God says, Job, it's, not your, it's your arrogance and sense of, of certainty that needs to be challenged. I long ago gave up believing in a God that said, well, if you do all the right things, if you keep all the rules, you'll be favored. And if you don't, I'm going to punish you. I long ago gave up believing in a God like that. Because I've lived long enough to know that, that I've tried to be faithful you know what? My life hasn't been spared from trial. Is yours? But we believe in a God manifest in the trinity of persons, creator, redeemer, sustainer or keeper of life, or known to us as Father, Jesus, and Spirit. We believe in a God who walks with us, who companions us, in the midst of all the trials that we face. We're not spared from them. And even in death, even at the grave, we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. So, there are purveyors, our brothers and sisters in the Christian faith, some who would continue to suggest that those who find favor with God are somehow blessed because they're doing the right things. And those who somehow find difficulty in their life are somehow punished by God. And we, today, now, are given an opportunity to stand up against that kind of imagery, that kind of understanding and theology and say, that's not the God we believe in. The God we believe in is most especially manifest in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. When Paul says, absolutely nothing, no height, no depth, no principality, no power, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. This is our faith. It's the faith of